Hi! As I promised in my previous video, today I will do a teardown of this HT-118A multimeter and uh, take a look inside. If you haven't watched that video, you might want to jump over and watch my review first. That video was a lot longer than my typical videos, as I did quite a bit of testing against a voltage standard and also checked on the frequency response of the AC measurement range. And my sole intention was really to just help you to decide for yourself whether or not this is the right meter for you. Now, by the way, just to be clear, I did not receive any money nor any sales commissions from the sellers for my review. Anyway, although it was intended to be a pretty thorough review, I still managed to forget a couple of important things, which I will quickly show you before proceeding to the teardown. The first thing I forgot to share my opinion with you is the range switch. And as you can hear here, the range switching is pretty solid. And you can definitely tell which range you are currently in without any ambiguity. And it is not too soft or too hard and it's easy for you to operate using one hand. But it doesn't sound as crisp as the range switch found on a BK Precision 2709B. But it's definitely better than the average meters found on the market. And another thing I want to show you is the viewing angle of the LCD. And as you can see, the viewing angle is pretty decent. And in fact, most of the time is uh, very excellent. It doesn't matter wh which angle you're looking at. Now, with the backlight on, uh, you will see that uh, it looks pretty good from bottom angle. But when you are uh, looking from the top down at certain angles, the uh, screen washes out. And then when you, you know, go even more vertical, it comes back. Now, this is less of a concern as most of the time you are actually operating looking up, uh, looking at meter this way rather than from top down. But if you ever find yourself in that situation, just kind of a tilt the uh, meter a little bit more or a little bit less, you will be able to see the readings here. And uh, this one has a little bit of gimmicky uh, back flashlight that I forgot to mention is when you press down the button here and you will see that it turns into a flashlight. Now, is it useful? Probably not, but nevertheless, it's a built-in function of this multimeter. And this meter also comes with this uh, thermocouple, as I showed you last time, so you can use that to measure temperatures. Now, of course, the actual measurement uh, accuracy is probably going to be a few degrees uh, plus minus, so it's not going to be that useful. Nevertheless, it's a nice feature to have, especially if you are measuring, say, a heat sink uh, temperature and things like that. And also, you can see oh, this dual display really helps here. You can, you can have a uh, Celsius and a Fahrenheit displayed at the same time. So anyway, so that's uh, what I forgot to show you last time. So now let's proceed to the teardown. And uh, the holster was surprisingly hard to remove. It was a really tight fit. But anyway, so now we got that out of the way. Also, I removed the uh, back of the battery cover, which is uh, secured by this one uh, machine screw here. And, uh, but everything else, the four screws at the corners, are all self-tappers. And given the price point of this meter, we really couldn't have uh, expected too much more. Now with all the screws out of the way, let's uh, open it up and uh, take a look at what's inside here. And by the way, I'll be taking a lot of pictures and also upload to my website. For those who are interested, wanted to see a little bit more detail, you can go to my website and check them out. One thing became apparent while looking at this board is how barren this board really is. And as I suspected, in order to make a meter uh, at this range for this specification, a lot of corner had been cut. And this is very apparent if you look at the input section here. 
If you have opened up a quality meter before, you would have seen that inputs are typically protected by MOFs and PTCs. Now here, uh, by the way, this is the positive input voltage measurement jack. And you can see we do have two tiny PTCs, but MOFs are nowhere to be seen. And MOFs are important as they are there to absorb transients. And for a CAT3 and CAT4 rated meter, the MOFs are almost certainly a required component. So as I have been talking about all along, these kind of cheap meters are most suited for electronics work, where uh, energy involved is relatively low. And the second thing where they have cut corner is if you look at the fuses, these are not HRC fuses. These are just a typical ceramic fuses. Now, in a high energy event, these fuses would almost certainly burst. And because there's also no blast shield surrounding the fuse, like some other high end meters we have seen before, uh, the fuse fragments would be shattered all over the place and possibly cause other damage to your circuit. So clearly, this is another design consideration that uh, uh, a lot of high-end meters has but is lacking in this meter. And the next thing I want to point out is the use of this uh, current sensing resistor here and this is for the 10 amp range and as we can see the current sensing resistor is this uh, 50 ohm uh, resistor here and it's a surf surface mounted resistor. Now this one, I doubt the tempo would be as low as your typical chromium wire, which uh, uh, is, has very low tempo and is generally used for this kind of high current uh, current shunt. But this is just a standard resistor. And because of the higher tempo, when you are measuring current for a prolonged period of time, especially under high current situations, the self-heating of the resistor is going to be very significant and that's going to cause your uh, measuring results to drift significantly. The input jack looks okay from this angle and uh, I will have to take it further apart to see exactly how it was constructed. Now let's uh, move on to the uh, to this side here and uh, I do see some good things here. For example, this is your positive uh, input voltage input and uh, obviously the input goes through these uh, PTCs and uh, so this trace would be going here. Now if you can see the separation of the trace, uh, the clearance is pretty high. So that is certainly a good thing as we're talking about uh, possibly could be inputting 1000 volts from the, your input jack. Okay, so now let me move uh, it down a little bit and also zoom in so you can see a uh, little bit more detail here. So I do like these kind of uh, uh, contacts for your battery terminals. By the way, the battery used here are two uh, AA batteries and I really like that compared to 9 volts as it's just more convenient to change and also it potentially lasts a lot longer than your 9 volts. And uh, so these kind of terminals are very good instead of uh, having to solder wires to connect to your battery case. And uh, just by looking at it, I see another place where there is a, uh, some cost saving. As you can see here, we have the battery goes along this possibly to a diode and to what appears to be a footprint of a unpopulated capacitor. I don't know why they decided to remove it. And the reason being that you are connected to a battery terminal and as the battery's internal resistance increase you know doing some kind of a measurement you may have some fluctuation of the current and that could cause your voltage to fluctuate as well so by having a smoothing capacitor at the output at the output of the battery terminal definitely helps that situation but for cost savings uh, they also decided that is not necessary here now let's take a look at the main circuit portion of this multimeter. Towards the middle, that would be your DMM chip. Now I don't know exactly what chip they used since they just used a chip on board design to cut cost and there's no marking or anything like that. But uh, some people were saying that this would be a DTM0660. And if that's the case, that would be the same chip that used in my analogic meter. 
Um, so, which probably is a variant of that chip. As you can see here, we also have this EEPROM, and uh, this one also is uh, used to store the calibration data and uh, configurations and whatnot. And uh, towards uh, down here, actually, this chip is to drive the uh, LCD on the other side. And uh, here we have a, mm, a chip with marking totally send it off. So I'm not entirely sure what, why that would be. And, uh, but anyway, so it's probably just some logic chip of some kind. And here we have this uh, white LED that is used as a flashlight. Now, I'm really not sure what the design decision was. Instead of using this uh, white LED, for instance, the uh, DTM, if it was a DTM0660 chip, it does support this IR data link. And if I were the designer, I would put a uh, infrared IR LED here to actually hook up to the data link so that you can communicate with your computer and whatnot. I did a quick look at uh, around this uh, chip and I did not see any obvious empty pins that is unused. So that made me believe that probably even if they did have this IR capability, uh, that pin was actually not brought out. And this is really unfortunate because if we had those pins out here, we could have uh, soldered a, an IR LED ourselves and enable that data link inside the CEPROM as what I did with the analogic multimeter, if you recall. And towards this corner, you can see a, an inductor here. And that is probably, if I have to guess, is to step up the voltage, probably the voltage needed by the LCD on the other side. And uh, that is pretty much all there is on this side of the uh, board. So I think what I'm going to do next is to uh, take all these screws out and uh, flip the board over. And we'll take a look at what is on the other side. There were quite a few self-tapped screws holding the board in. I'm glad I put this uh, case on top of this uh, holster here as uh, the range switch was protruding. And if I didn't put it up here, actually when I took the board out, everything would be popped open and I will show you. Uh, this one does have a, a little bit de delicate here because it has two ball bearings on the range switch. And that is what is uh, pressing it down uh, when you hear that uh, uh, the range switching sound and feel. And so the uh, pressure of this uh, these uh, springs, I guess is just about right. So that's why the feel was pretty solid here. And let me put it back before I lose that, those balls here. Okay. So now, let me just see. Yep, so that's it seated correctly. And now we can see this uh, membranes these buttons and there's nothing special they're, they're a little bit on the stiff side and i forgot to mention that but uh, you know it doesn't really matter that much one thing i want to point out is actually quite clever here are these uh, light guides and you can see one two three four and this is what is uh, eliminating these sockets now the sockets do come off in fact when i was uh, uh, taking it out earlier they all came out so let me see if I can carefully remove one of these. Uh, I will re remove one off camera and show you. And uh, here is that uh, socket here. So there are four of them. But there is a, a light guide and uh, that's what is illuminating the uh, around the socket on the other side. So that's quite clever. I like that design. And here is the, uh, the board on the other side. Of course, as I suspected, there really isn't uh, too much here. But of course, you can see we have this uh, presumably a uh, date code that is, uh, if I read it correctly, is actually made in 2020 and the 26th week. So this is a fairly new board. And uh, now uh, this is actually the backlight plate because we have multiple colors. So you have uh, uh, presumably two LEDs. That's why you have three wires going in. 
Now the LCD here uh, is just a standard LCD here and uh, so so there's not too much to that. Uh, one thing I want to point out is, are these uh, uh, input jacks. So as you can see they're not particularly uh, held together that strong and if you look at a the solder there's just one blob of solder here and that's about it. So I wondered if the long-term reliability going to be an issue but nevertheless this portion does serve as a little bit of a strain relief so presumably that is better than you just uh, solder onto the board directly and uh, here you can also see uh, these are the tracks for the rain switch now they do look pretty shiny probably it's uh, I'm not sure if it's gold plated but it's definitely plated so that presumably it will uh, last for a while, but only time can tell. And if you look closely, you will see a lot of uh, residue from the soldering. So clearly, the, all these were uh, hand soldered, including what is uh, up here. And uh, so again, all these are you know low cost and uh, not anything special. And uh, there are a few more programming headers here for the EEPROM. And here towards the top, this metal tab, that's your non-contact voltage measurement uh, sensor. So another thing interesting to point out is throughout this board, you don't see a single test pad. So I'm wondering how do they really uh, calibrate this thing after it's uh, done or being assembled? Probably they don't really bother to calibrate it at all. So that's another reason the cost of this meter can be uh, made so low as well. Okay, so now it's time to put everything back together. So here's a verdict. The HT-189A is a pretty good meter in terms of its functionality and accuracy, especially considering its price point. The quality of the PCB is pretty decent as well, but I would definitely not recommend using it as an electrician's meter, as we saw that it was highly unlikely that this meter would have met the actual CAT3 and CAT4 requirements. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up. Remember to subscribe, share. I will catch up with you next time.